Welcome back, everybody. It's the Betting Pros College Football Preview Show Bowls Edition. I am your host, Scott Bogman. I am here, as always, with Thor KU on the Twitter machine, Thor Nystrom. He is here, and Mike Farrell at M Farrell Sports, two R's, two L's on the Twitter machine. Gentlemen, let's do it quick. But since maybe the people who listen to this on a, you know, on an every week basis didn't get your take on how the college football uh, playoff finished off here and you know florida state being left off thor your quick opinion on all of that did they get the four right teams does it even matter what do you think they did because we're trying to put the best product on the field and this is what it is now both those games are intriguing whereas you would have given michigan state a quasi buy you put florida state in the reaction when they showed inside the michigan team room when they announced alabama as the four seed i thought was very telling of that uh you heard some groans in there uh, like, we're, oh, we don't get a free pass. So, yeah, I mean, the, the committee made the, the right call with what the criterion is. And the criterion, they not only allow you, they instruct you to factor in player injuries, et cetera, that depreciate the team quality. They they made the correct decision. Mike, your thoughts? Uh, we got the right four teams. We got the right matchups. Um, but they got screwed. Florida State got screwed. That's just the way it is. Undefeated Power 5 Conference Championships. I, I don't care, you know, style points at the end. They looked horrible against Louisville offensively. It was ugly. There's wildcat stuff going on. I, I didn't want to see it, but there's just no way around the fact that they got screwed. I mean, and that's the yeah. way it is, and that's okay. I mean, Alabama is the big fish, and you know the SEC ties in with ESPN and all the conspiracy theories. I get it. We've got the matchups. I don't want to see Florida State against Michigan. I, I want right. to see Alabama against Michigan, but unequivocally, Florida State got absolutely screwed. They did everything they needed to do. They went undefeated throughout the season. They won their conference. Unprecedented for them to be left out. I mean, we had an undefeated group of five team get in, you know, and, and not a power five now. So it's because the SEC was down. It's because we didn't have an SEC represent, you know, representative. Um, and, and so they had to they had to slide one in there and that's life. But Florida State got screwed. Yeah, I mean, um, we knew someone was getting hosed, right? If this is how it worked out and, uh, you know, all these teams won, we knew somebody was getting hosed. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it's Florida State, but. Next year, we won't have this issue. If you're complaining about being 13 and not getting into the top 12, uh, then you should have done more. We can say that. Top four, top two, there's always a gripe about it. It happens every year. And the reason that we have this criteria, right, Thor, is because we saw Cincinnati get slaughtered. We saw TCU get murdered. Um, you know, this is why we have this criteria is because people complain before about the best teams not getting in. It was just the teams that, you know, fit the bill. So I don't know. It's it seems like a damned if you do, damned if you don't argument, but it doesn't matter. All that matters, gentlemen, is Texas is in the playoff. They're gonna win. <laughs> They're going to the Natty. It's in Houston. I'm gonna buy a ticket. I'm gonna have a great time. So uh, that okay. is all that matters. Of course, we are going to get to some bowls to talk about for you guys. We're gonna do the bowls from the 16th to the 22nd here, um, starting this Saturday and working through to next Friday. But before we dive in, I got to tell you guys to check out the Betting Pro CFB Bowl Game Bowl Game Challenge on Splash Sports. This game is a straight up pick 'em contest, no against the spread, with some added weight scoring to the New Year's game, semis, and the final. So all you need to do is to enter the game before the first game starts on the 16th. Get your picks in before each game start. It, like I said, it's against the spread. The cost is only $25, and the top 25% will be paid out. The prize pool is determined by how many people enter, so get in today. For more details to enter the contest, go to bettingpros.com slash bowl. That's bettingpros.com slash bowl. All right, Thor. Let's start with the first game, the Myrtle Beach Bowl. Guess where that is? It's in Conway, South Carolina. Uh, Georgia Southern is a three and a half point favorite against Ohio. Forty eight and a half is the total in this game. Do you feel a side or a total in this game? Because the public is split. Uh, Ohio on tickets, Southern on cash. Uh, both sides are picking the under here. Is that something you agree with? <laughs> It is. Yeah, I, I got a I believe the, the ticket I got on that was 50 and a half. And, and we, we come down now. Uh, what, 48 and a half, you said? Yeah, 48 yeah, and a half. Uh, my systems total on that game, Bogman, 38.3. Yeah. 
Ooh, we're getting some value, some line so, value here. So I, I love the under. I also love uh, Georgia Southern in this game. My system's line on that game is Georgia Southern minus 7.7. And, and I'll say these are not lines in the vacuum of if both these teams were, you know, full strength during the season and on a random neutral field. I bake in partial home field advantages based on where the game is played, based on projecting how many fans could be there, et cetera, proximity to home. And then also, of course, adjustments for the opt outs. So that, that's what I'm going to be getting a lot into where, where I make the adjustments on those. The, the thing, the story in this game is Ohio is decimated. Ohio lost Curtis Rourke to the transfer portal. He says he's going to consider the NFI. I would imagine he's, he's going to be transferring elsewhere. Um, we've already seen a couple of the, the leading contenders for him. I think he's going to the power five. They also lost their top two running backs, uh, Cy Ben-Gurra and Oshawn Allison. They only played two running backs. The, the other, the, the top snap guy in running back, uh, running backs for that team that's still there, he had 16 snaps this season. So And, and they do the rotation. So it's going to be their three and four guy, but they haven't played this year. Miles Cross opted out for them, their, their wide receiver two. And then Tyler Walton, their wide receiver three. Not only that, their backup quarterback, C.J. Harris, who started the bowl game last year, he he, he had some where he got ruled out for the season in September. They have so many defections. Hard to, a medical um, undisclosed medical emergency is what C.J. Harris said, where he, he pulled the plug in September. You add all this stuff up, they're down to their third string quarterback in a backfield that is a heavy run team with third and fourth string running backs that we haven't seen all year. They only have the one good receiver in Wigloos. He is a good player, but the the rest of them, we I mean, who knows who even the backup receivers who are going to be playing. I will say Ohio's defense is good. It's actually really good. Uh, I was like 16th or 18th SP plus. One of the reasons that I like the under, but a contextual thing with that, Ohio didn't play any team that could throw the ball this year. All the MAC offenses were terrible. And then in the non-con, they played like San Diego State. They played an FCS team, different stuff like that. So they're, you know, on the surface, it looks like they have really good pass defense numbers. They didn't play one even average passing offense this year. I, I think Georgia Southern puts the hammer to them here because um, I just don't see how Ohio is going to score points in this game. Clay Helton has struggled in bowl games over the course of his career. That was something we talked about in advance of the the uh, uh, quick lane bowl last year when Jerry Kill went to play Bowling Green. Jerry Kill had not won a bowl game before that. The, his team was obviously very motivated to turn that around for him. I, I think it's going to be the same thing here. This one's Georgia Southern big, and and we're going the under as well. I don't think Ohio is going to be able to score. Farrell, your thoughts on uh, the Myrtle Beach Bowl, Georgia Southern versus Ohio? Are you with Thor? I'm I'm going under. Uh, I'm going under in a lot of these games that you're going to notice because. What I noticed over the last couple of years with the defections, uh, with new players, you know, jumping in, you just mentioned, you know, two new running backs, uh, a quarterback with a lot of, without a lot of experience. It leads to, you know, low scoring games, it leads to sort of dumbed down offensive game plans, uh, conservative stuff, leads to really boring bowl games. Um, and this one reeks of a Big Ten West type of atmosphere. I think this is going to be a low scoring game. So I'm going to go under. I, I think, I think there could be an upset here. I mean, I, I know he's got Georgia Southern. You know, his, his system has seven, and it's three and a half. Uh, it wouldn't shock me to see some of these guys step up. Uh, I think they're a well coached football team, but I'm not touching the side whatsoever. I'm just laying money on the under. All right, let's go over to the next bowl up. That is going to be the New Orleans Bowl in the Superdome. Jacksonville State is the three point favorite against Louisiana, fifty nine and a half is the uh, total here. And Thor, completely opposite. Everybody's on Jacksonville State. Everybody's on the over. Do you share a different opinion on that? I do. Yeah, um, and I actually surprised myself because I that was my lean initially. More I got into this game, you can't justify that line being at three and a half. First of all, you, the Louisiana team in the much better conference, um, the, the strength of the schedules, they're not too far off, but Louisiana played a better procession of teams, obviously, than, than Jacksonville State did in the CUSA. But this is also a quasi-home field for Louisiana being played in New Orleans. You, you would anticipate that they're going to have a significant crowd advantage in this one, obviously less to travel. The opt-out situation, it's fairly close when you bake in both the opt-outs and the injuries. Jacksonville State, it's only their kicker 
is in is in the portal. Not that big of a loss. Louisiana did lose a starting linebacker who's pretty solid, a kid named Kendrick Grant. He's their number three graded PFF uh, defender overall. Also their best linebacker. But that kid's a tall, sort of skinny, angular type linebacker who's really good against the pass, pass rushing and in coverage. Where he struggles, it's against the run. As you know, what does Jacksonville State do? Run, run, run. They can't pass. The the downgrade from Gantt to his backup in terms of run defense, it's pretty negligible. So in this game, in, like in, in another matchup, that, that loss would have hurt a lot more. In this one, I'm not sure that it hurts a ton. I just nicked him a little bit for it. The, the other thing, uh, Jacksonville State is going to be without one of their best defenders, maybe the best, Jalen Swain. Uh, they're a, a star edge rusher. They're also missing uh, an ancillary uh, cornerback whose who's stats are just kind of okay. They, they're probably going to be able to replace him a little bit better. Louisiana's down to their third-string quarterback, but that's a bit deceiving because the third-string kid who came in, he probably should have been starting from the start of the season. He had 350 snaps last year, and he's been by far their best guy when he's been on the field this year. Uh, I'm talking about Chandler Fields. Down the stretch, last three games, he played really well. Um, his PFF passing grades were 82 or above each game. One of those games was against Troy, who has a really, really good defense. I I mean, like Jacksonville State's going to take aim at this Louisiana run defense that is only 116th in success rate. So that's, I think, the path that a lot of this market's looking at to be like, oh, Jacksonville State's going to have success. But the Raging Cajuns suppress explosive runs. They're number nine in that. So uh, Jacksonville State's only going to be able to chip away, chip away, chip away. They're assuredly going to get into third and long situations where they are at a decided disadvantage throwing into the Louisiana pass defense. And on the other side, Jacksonville State has a really good run defense. Their pass defense is not nearly as good. I think this Chandler Fields game, we saw it down the stretch, like I said, the last three, four games. Um, they've been ha- having success throwing the ball. I-, I-, I think Louisiana is going to have that here as well. I'm taking the three and a half or three, depending on where it's at your book. I, I feel like that's a gift. I'm also on the over uh, 59 and a half because, I, you know, Jacksonville State plays fastest tempo adjusted in the entire nation. Louisiana is slightly above average in tempo. I see the pass for success for both offenses here. So I'm taking the points of Louisiana. And I'm going over. Uh, Mike, what do you think about this game? Are you uh, on the Louisiana side as well over or are you taking Jacksonville State? Nope. I'm taking Jacksonville State. I think they're going to be able to run the ball effectively. Um, I know, you know, a lot of big runs aren't given up, but uh, success in the run game, if they get four yards, four yards, make it third and short, you know, Thor's talking about third and long, and that could be a situation that Jacksonville State gets in, and, and that's not going to be good for them. But I think they're going to be able to consistently run the football. I don't I don't bake in any home field advantage for bowls like this. I, you know, they just the attendance of these bowls is so sparse. It's awful. Uh, it, it's going to be, you know, I, I used to do that a long time ago. I used to look, oh my God, this team's from Louisiana. They're playing in Louisiana. It's a, it's a, and then I, and then, I and then over the years, I look at the, I look at the attendance numbers and I look at the, the, you know, when they pan to the field and I'm like, there's nobody here. Nobody cares. So if they have a 5,000 fan advantage, it's not really going to be a big deal to me. And I like Rich Rodriguez. I like what he's done. I like his ability to keep. All and, right. and and one thing there to, to add, Bogman, uh, Farrell and I, we, we have the, the same lean on the total. A contextual piece for people out there, Rich Rodriguez, the nine bowl games that he has coached in, each one, nine of nine, has gone over the total. Oh, wow. I think we're going to make it 10 for 10 on Saturday. <laughs> It'll be uh, a lot of people angry at Rich Rod if it doesn't go 10 for 10, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, let's go to Thor the will be bowl. one of them. <laughs> Thor will be one of them for sure. Too many over tickets. Um, let's go to the Cure Bowl in Orlando, Florida. Miami of Ohio going up against App State. App State is a six and a half point favorite. 45 and a half is a total here. Another game that is split between tickets and cash. Tickets on App, cash on Miami. Uh, tickets on the under, cash way on the over here, Thor. So Miami, Ohio, you talked about Miami a couple weeks ago. They play well above their head. There's probably going to be a big discrepancy in terms of talent, but Miami, Ohio keeps chipping away and getting these wins. What do you think about this game? Yeah, they're a team that's near and dear to my heart because I think of them as the Iowa Hawkeyes of the G5. <laughs> they play the exact same way. Their their statistical profile is the exact same thing. Miami of Ohio, 
133rd out of 133 teams in adjusted tempo. So they play at the snail's pace. They run the ball a lot. The quarterback scrambles around, although we got a QB switch in this one I'll talk about in a second. But their defense is awesome. 15th SP plus special teams is even better. Number one SP plus special teams. That's something that even Iowa can be a little jealous of. I thought I was going to be making my first ding of a team ever on the line in a bowl game for a special teams loss when Miami's Luke Groza award-winning kicker previously opted out to go into the transfer portal. He announced last week he's coming back and he's going to play in this game because Miami's uh, their special teams, it's such a hidden advantage, but it's a big advantage. They win the the field position game throughout their kick. Their kickoff team's awesome. The punting team is awesome. And then they're also gaining extra points just in the kicks themselves. Like that, that field goal kicker does not miss kicks. I think they're number five in the nation in points added on uh, the the kicks, field goals, and and extra points this season in the nation. But just a fabulous one. This one was, uh, you know, when I went into this one, and and you've seen Avion Smith opted out. He's the number two quarterback for Miami. Miami had already lost Gabbert. So you're like, oh, we're going to have to go down to a third-string kid that that hasn't played before. Obviously, they didn't like him enough to play him over the other guys. You know, and and Appy had played so well down the stretch, their offense – I thought when I went into this handicap, I was going to be unhappy. Certainly, that's where the market went. This line was four and a half last week. Now it's at six and a half. Deeper I got into this one, this line is wrong. This is a coin flip game. My my uh, my system's got a number on this of Appalachian State minus two point seven. Uh, this th- just what we see quantifiably in this thing. It can't support being up near a touchdown. Uh, Miami, the only guys they've, it's Avion Smith, and then they lost a cornerback who has zero snaps. That's the only losses they've had. And if you want to say, oh well, they're down to their third string quarterback, that's going to be problematic. Fair enough. But let me read for you Avion Smith's stats this year: fifty percent <laughs> completions. Two to two TDI and T rate. The guy can't throw. All he could do is scramble around. And by the way, I looked into that too. He's not good on outside runs. The only value that Avion Smith gave them, it was up the middle running. Uh, The Amos kid, who is their stud running back with 240 pound locomotive. He's a bit better on the inside runs, as you might imagine. They also have this Kenny Tracy kid that comes in. Miami runs the ball very effectively. Surprisingly, they're one of the most explosive run uh, run games in the NCAA. Appalachian State happens to be one of the worst defenses in the NCAA in terms of allowing explosive runs. So Miami's just going to keep this on the ground, keep this on the ground, keep this on the ground. When that third stringer, Henry Hassan, when he has to throw, he's going to be throwing to one of the the G5's best receivers, Gage Larvidane who was going uh, ballistic at the beginning of the season. Then he got injured. He's going to be the healthiest that he has been in this game. They're not going to throw a ton. Miami's going to stay super-duper conservative. But when they do, I I think there's a path there for them as well. Uh, Smith is not a big loss, whereas Appalachian State, they lost Nate Noel, best offensive player. They lost Deshaun Davis, their their wide receiver three. They lost a, a decently used rotational edge rusher in Donovan Spellman. Appy State lost a whole bunch more than Miami did. I and last thing I'll say about this, I talked about this heading into the um the their conference title game, the Sunbelt Conference title game. As far as Joey Aguilar, Joey Aguilar 33 to 9 TDI and T rate, but he has a less than one ratio of big time throws to turnover worthy plays PFF. Regression was coming on that kid. Like I said, we talked about that in in, in our conference title previews. He didn't he Going into that game, five straight games, go, heading into the Troy game, that Aguilar kid had thrown for three touchdowns or more, zero t- throwing touchdowns in the game against Troy. Obviously, they, they got whipped in that one. I I think Miami ambushes them here. I'm taking the six and a half points, but, but I think they're going to win this outright. Chuck Martin, 4-0 against the spread in bowl games, typically suppresses the scoring, keeps this thing close, turns it into a coin flip at the end, and no one's better at winning those coin flips at the very end uh, in, in these games that he can get close. So I, I'm taking Miami to win this one outright. Yeah. Farrell, uh, I mean, sounds like Thor is very passionate about this game. And on the Red Hawks, of course, we'll see him draped in Red Hawks gear uh, from head to toe should Miami win this game. Your thoughts on this? I mean, App State still a good team. You know, snap James Madison's winning streak, all that stuff. Uh, good squad here. Do you think they can win this game? They are the favorites by almost a touchdown. Yeah, I think they're going to win. I'm not sure if they're going to cover. Um, you know, it's going to be a low scoring game. It's going to field field position game. I love the coaching staff at Miami. I love the way they game plan. I like the way they keep things close. They don't let things get out of hand. They have a slow pace. They're not going to, you know, there's not going to be a lot of three and outs. Um, you know, Iowa is the king of three and outs. This team actually 
can move the football a little bit better than Iowa, even though they don't have a good offense and a, an explosive offense, they can consistently drives. If they have to punt, he talked about the special teams. You know, they're, they're very good in all aspects of that. So I think they're going to keep this game close simply by field position, good defense, smart coaching. App State, I think, is going to win. They're, they've been kind of erratic. They, they came on near the end of the season, but it's too big a line for me. I, this would be a field goal game where I'd have trouble. But if you're going to get All six right, let's point, go over to it. the New Mexico Bowl. Speaking of uh, partially attended, New Mexico State is a three and a half point favorite, basically at home, versus Fresno State. The total is 51 and a half. Uh, Cash tickets on New Mexico State side, both cash and tickets are on the over here, Thor. So when you look at the New Mexico uh, Bowl in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico State, you you talked about factoring in, uh, you know, home field advantage and all that stuff. I don't know that it matters that much in this game. Fresno State is a good squad, but tell me why New Mexico State is favored and if you agree with that. They're definitely going to have the crowd advantage there. Uh, the New Mexico Bowl wanted New Mexico State. New Mexico State wanted to play in the New Mexico Bowl. And I'm not sure how much of the Fresno State fan base is going to be traveling over for this thing. You know, particularly Jeff Tedford is not going to be coaching in this one. He had a health issue he needed to tend to. Um, the opt-outs on this side, not as much. The Tedford loss is definitely the biggest on both sides. New Mexico did not have a guy opt-out who had more than 85 snaps played. Uh, Fresno State, their pack of quarterback Fife, he transferred actually up into my backyard here at Minnesota. And then they had a decent safety, but a kid that only played 282 snaps this year. The injuries are a little bit bigger of a deal. Fresno State had lost their starting left tackle. This kid named Jacob Spomer for the year. He was by far that team's best backup, or I'm sorry, the best starting offensive lineman. The backup is a kid named Torian Penwright, and I'm I'm sorry that I said your name because I'm about to to rip you here, Torian. That kid got lit up this year when they they put him in there. So he only had 58 pass pro reps this year, um, but he allowed multiple sacks. Or I'm sorry, he he allowed two sacks. The team leader in sacks allowed only allowed three. And we're talking about guys who had 700 snaps or whatever. This the Penrite kid also 8.6 pressure rate allowed. That was six. Point six flat, 6% higher than any of the team's top six offensive linemen in terms of snaps. I realize it was a smaller uh, sample, but in that sample, he's given up these big plays in the sacks or whatever. Spomer's specialty was pass protection, 1.3 pressure rate allowed in 392 uh, pass pro reps. That's a very big downgrade. Obviously, the coaching downgrade from Tedford to the interim is big, too. New Mexico State has one of the better coaches in the nation, in my opinion, on their sideline in Jerry Kill. And and on uh, New Mexico State, in terms of injuries for them, Diego Pavia's status has been up in the air. You know, he played through some injuries. He'd have multiple ones. Shoulder injury is what knocked him out of the Conference USA title game. So his status was a bit up in the air. Uh, it's three or four days ago, Jerry Kill came out publicly and said, Diego Pavia is starting and playing in this game. We're going to get him. That was the only question that we had because of all this stuff. My line on this game is New Mexico State minus 4.1. We're pretty close to the margins here. I'm also close on the total. My my system total on this game, 50.2 uh, in Vegas right now, 51 and a half. So we're very close on both of them. I got to lean to New Mexico State, though. They, you, you have the advantage in the coaching. You don't have as many questions as far as the guys that aren't going to play. The, this one's the fight and Jerry kills. Yeah, I mean, are you going on the kill side here, Mike? I mean, the, and what level of confidence in a game like this do you have if you're in, like, a confidence pool or, you know, any of those things? Is this one that you like or is this one that you're like, oh. I mean, it, it's, it's – both teams have – talent. I don't think there's a discernible roster advantage on one side or the other. I would lean towards New Mexico State. This is going to come down to, honestly, I believe you know, Jerry Kill is a great coach. Um, he, he prepares his teams well. He cares about these type of games. Um, Jeff Tedford is not going to be coaching. Um, I know it's a big opportunity for the rest of the coaching staff to step up there, but I, I'm not sure Fresno State is going to be into this game as much as New Mexico State is. So I mean, as Thor said, they wanted to play in this game. Nobody on the planet wants to play in this game, except for them. So they're excited. You know, if another team got relegated out to the New Mexico Bowl or whatever, they'd be like, ugh. And these guys are like, <laughs> yes, this is exactly where we're going to be. Um, you know, it's that old, you know, rare rabbit thing. Like, this is 
they're going to play hard. They're going to play well. They're going to cover this spread. So I'm going with Jerry Till and, and the coaching advantage. And Bogman, uh, two, two other contextual things there. Uh, one stat and then one contextual thing. New Mexico State played a team that was eerily similar to Fresno State during the regular season. Obviously, these teams play in different conferences. So I, you know, it's hard to sort of get one to one. Western Kentucky, if you look at, at their play calling tendency, you know, skewing very, very heavy pass, which Fresno State does as well. Very similar offensive system. Offensive quality, very similar. Defensive quality between Fresno State and Western Kentucky, very similar. The special teams was as well. They're like these mirror wow. teams on, on the opposite side of the country. New Mexico State beat uh, Western Kentucky 38-29 to 29 earlier this season, so I thought that was worth pointing out. And one other thing, um, this, is, this is one of my favorite stats that I, that I pulled up. There is only one program in the FBS that has played in more than one bowl game who has never lost a bowl game. I think you guys probably know where I'm going with this answer. New Mexico State. They played in five. <laughs> they are 4-0-1 in their bowl games, including last year, Kills first season. They go to the, the Quick Lane Bowl or the Motor City Bowl, whatever they're calling that one in Detroit. They beat Bowling Green as three-point underdogs. I, I think they're getting another one in this one and and by more than three, three and a half points. Yeah, I was steeped in tradition. Uh, a five five bowl streak of not losing. I love it. But hey, look, sometimes we see tradition grow before our eyes. I like it. How about the LA Bowl being played in SoFi? UCLA is in it. Another locational advantage. Boise State is their opponent. The line right now is UCLA by three and a half. Obviously, a lot going on with that roster. Uh, 49 and a half is a total. Cash and tickets are on Boise State and the under here, Thor. So your thoughts on the L.A. Bowl being played in SoFi? I love UCLA. Uh, UCLA was my first pick of the the bowl season. I, I got it at three, I think on a little bit less juice. I also love the under. Uh, 50 and a half was the number that I got. But where the number is now, I would still advocate for that. The line for UCLA is going to keep growing and the number, the total is going to keep dropping. Uh, and the reason why is Taylon Green uh, opted out. Taylon Green's on his way to try to save Sam Pittman's job and, and make, some ma- make some magic with Bobby Petrino back there in Fayetteville. Um, yeah, that's where he transferred. So he's out. But the problem for Boise State is Maddox Madsen, the quarterback, too, that was sort of platooning at times with Taylon Green this fall, he's out for the season because of an injury. So Boise State is going to be starting in this game a three-star true freshman quarterback who has never stepped on the field. His name is C.J. Tiller. Now, C.J. Tiller, the one thing he's got going for him is Ashton Genty returned to Boise State. I I heard some of the details of uh, his NIL package, and I I don't blame him for returning to (laughs) Boise State. Uh, George Halani will also be playing in this game. So Boise State will have the running game. However, I don't see how they throw it all. First of all, UCLA's pass defense was awesome this year. Uh, They were one of the better pass defenses in America. Now it's this C.J. Tiller kid who, again, has never thrown the ball before. And his receiving core is absolutely decimated. Uh, Eric McAllister, one of their top receivers, he left the team in November. They also have uh, multiple injuries. That Stephen Cobbs uh, hasn't played since week 10. He's not expected back. One of their backups, Chase Penry, is questionable. I don't think he's going to play either. Uh, Latrell Capels was expected to be a big contributor this year. He uh, had a leg injury in August. He'd been out for the season. So Boise State's receiving core is absolutely decimated. And again, you have this total unknown at quarterback. I get that UCLA is, you know, Dante Moore uh, is out, although I, to me that is a positive because <laughs> you're guaranteed that Dante Moore is not going to be on the field here. He was a big negative this year. Ethan Garbers was way better than him. Dante Moore is for the future, not for the present. Um, so starting Ethan Garbers is a value add for UCLA. The other opt-outs they had as far as the transfer portal guys, only guy that, that I really liked was Kamari Ramsey, who's a safety but again, uh, uh, Boise State is not going to be testing UCLA deep in here. They uh, UCLA did lose their stud edge, uh, Leatu Latu, to the NFL draft. That is a big loss, but it's certainly not big enough to mitigate the other stuff that we're talking on the Boise State side. My line on this one is UCLA close to five. So I would definitely advocate a bet here, three and a half, even if it gets to four. Even if it gets to four and a half, I would advocate for a bet on UCLA. And the under is a smash. It's still up near uh, uh, 50 Mine's uh, 45, so um, definitely definitely the under as well, UCLA and the under. All right, so uh, I believe that is both against the public here, Farrell. Are you with Mike, or are you with Thor, excuse me, on the, um, you know, the UCLA and the overbet? 
I mean, I'm going under. I think it's um, – I'm, I'm leaning towards that. I, I don't think Boise State's going to be able to throw the ball based on everything he, you know, told you. They're going to run the ball. Um, they're going to have a little bit of success. But UCLA's defense is extremely solid this year. Not spectacular, but solid. It's the reason why USC went and stole their defense coordinator away because USC realized across the town they got a much better About coordinator. Three years they got too much late. Defense. Yeah, three years too late, but in a much better scheme. Um, you know. So I, I think UCLA is going to be able to limit the points Boise gets. I, I don't think UCLA is going to score a ton. Um, you know, I, I see a low-scoring game, maybe 2017 type of thing. I know UCLA should be the favorite. I know they should win this football game. I know there's some things going on there with Chip Kelly. There's a lot of people unhappy on the inside as to the direction of this team and all this other garbage, which is the reason why he was rumored to be fired. It wasn't performance-wise. It was more like nobody really likes Chip. Um, not a surprise. That was the case at Oregon. It was the case in the NFL. But, you know, at least he won at Oregon. And he had some success with the Eagles. But if you're, you know, the second team in your own market um, and you're falling behind the rest of the Pac-12 and you're not liked, it's going to be an issue. So I don't think they're going to play it super hard. But I still think, you know, they're going to be able to pull out a victory here. But I look for a lower scoring game. I, I would hammer And I think I misspoke. Uh, hard, door is on think, uh, UCLA. You know, they're going to be able to under. pull. Yeah, he's yeah, on yeah. the under. Um, yeah, all right, let's under. go to the Independence Bowl in Shreveport, Louisiana. Cal is facing off against Texas Tech, who is a two-and-a-half point favorite in this game. 55-and-a-half is the total. Uh, tickets of cash on the over in this game, but they're split. Tickets on Cal, cash on Texas Tech, Thor. So straighten us out. Who do we like in this game? I like Cal in this game. Uh, I think this should be a coin flip, and you're getting three. Uh, my line is Texas Tech minus 0 0.4. So basically, yeah, pick them. Um, taking the three, I'm going to do that uh, every time. Texas Tech, they did get good news when their running back, Taj Brooks, decided to come back. Uh, he announced that recently. He had considered the NFL draft. Uh, he's one of the – well, actually, he led the nation in missed tackles for us, 92 of them. And Cal's defense, I will say, contextually struggles to tackle. That is the best matchup by far that Tech has in this thing. Almost every other one I looked at is in favor of Cal. But Taj Brooks should have a decent game. Texas Tech has a bad run defense, and that's going to be a problem for them because Jay Knott is going to have an enormous game. So this would be an over, a prop game over on both the running backs. Texas Tech, I, I feel like when they get into the third and longs, that's where, where there's going to be a problem. So Texas Tech starting left tackle, he's their best offensive lineman, this, this guy named uh, Monroe Mill. He opted out, uh, was probably the biggest opt out um, on both sides. Texas Tech also had two starting receivers that opted out. They had two of their used backup uh, receivers also opted out. So they got to go pretty deep on the depth chart in, in terms of that. And uh, even though and Tyler Shuck's obviously out for the year. Now now he's at Louisville. Uh, Baron Morton going to be playing in this one. Baron Morton should be healthier, but he did not acquit himself terribly well this season. And now he's thrown to this receiving core that really only has Xavier White. Uh, uh, Dre McCray is the other one that stuck around. He's just sort of a guy. I think they're going to have to play more of the uh, Mason Tharp and Baylor Cup. They're two tight ends in the slot there. And and the, the outside receivers, you know, they, they take a shot too because Jerome Br uh, Bradley was one of the guys that opted out. On the Cal side, not not as many opt-outs that matter. Really the only one that does, they had a starting linebacker, linebacker Caleb Alarms Orr, who's out. Uh, he's a team's leading tackler, uh, but he's not a flash player. He has very modest Havoc numbers. Um, he cleans up against the run, so he would have helped uh, for sure against Brooks. But outside of that, that doesn't hurt as much. I, I just like Cal Moore in this one. Again, you're talking about a coin flip game where you're getting three points. So I, I, I definitely like Cal. I'm probably staying away from the, the total. My system's very close. It would lean over slightly. 57 and a half uh, is what I'm seeing. But my, my system total was about 60. So I, I'd have a slight lean that way. But uh, uh, Cal is my play. And, uh, Mike, in this game, are you on the Cal side as well? Do you like Texas Tech more? This one this one seems like a close, close game. I'm going to go to the Joey McGuire's. Um, it's going to be a running back battle, as you mentioned, you know, Ott versus Brooks. Brooks coming back, I think. Honestly, it's a big lift for the team. Um, not that that's going to, you know, spark them to a victory in a bowl game or anything like that, but, I mean, it, it's a big deal. I mean, this guy was, I think, fourth in the nation in rushing. Um you know, he, he's coming back. Running backs are devalued in the NFL draft, at least temporarily. People think that's forever. It's not forever. But right now, 
you know, coming back is probably a better idea for him. Um, he's going to have something to prove. This is kind of his, you know, showcase at the end of the season, heading into next season for the NFL draft. Um, and Cal can't tackle him. They're just not going to be able to tackle him. Ott is a very good running back. He's going to get Texas Tech fits as well. I think both players are going to have big games. But I'm going to go with the Joey Maguires here. Um, I think Brooks coming back. I think they're going to feed him. I think he's going to have a huge game to be 200 yards. and under just because it's going to be such a you know a running game battle but i'm going to yeah it uh, seems like a fun game to watch if you like some good running back play that's going to be a really fun one get get some scouting in for sure in that one that is all the games on saturday so we're going to move forward here but before we move over to monday through friday's games if you would like a chance to win a premium one-year subscription to Betting Pros, your place to start betting smarter and not harder. You need to subscribe to the Betting Pros YouTube channel right now. Comment below on this video. That's it. We will be announcing a winner right here on the channel, so make sure to turn on those notifications so you can be alerted when new episodes are up and to claim your prize. Let's go to... The state steeped in perdition, famous toastery bowl in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is Western Kentucky versus Old Dominion. The spread is ODU by two and a half. 55 and a half is the total in this game. ODU is favored in tickets and cash. We only have information on the uh, tickets for the total, and it is 50 50. So. This is uh, one of the tougher games to explain here, Thor. So how do you see this one going? Yeah, we we have a lot of opt-outs here, uh, a lot of them. The Western Kentucky one, they've gotten more attention, um, you know, in terms of that. Malachi Corley, the stud receiver, you're going to go on day two in April. He's opting out to start his draft preparation. But Western Kentucky's offensive line also got wiped out. Um, West Dorsey is starting tackles out for this game. Uh, he transfer portal transfer portal also for their starting center Vincent Murphy and then also their stud starting left guard uh, Quintavious Leslie so they lose three different starting offensive linemen they also had two of their better defenders Desmond Baker a linebacker and Upton Stout a safety who's a top 50 portal guy in ESPN's rankings they're all out when I started handicapping this game I thought for sure I was going to be all over old Dominion um, the, their opt-outs were not nearly as bad Javon Harvey is it, he's their most targeted receiver, but uh, statistically wasn't wasn't great this year. He what he he's like their outlet receiver. It's the shorts, the quick hitting stuff. Sure, basically Harvey's an extension of the running game. Uh, I I don't think he's the biggest loss. Jordan Bly, uh, Dre Bly's son, another receiver there. He opted out. Uh, Dr- uh, Jordan Bly was not good this year. Uh, they're they're not going to miss him. I'm I'm sorry to say. Um, Terry Jones is solid starting safety for Old Dominion. He was the other one. But like I said, I, I came into this one and I was like, I'm going to be all over Old Dominion. Then I saw that Jason Henderson is going to miss this game. That was announced by Old Dominion. Jason Henderson is one of the best linebackers in the nation. By the tackle numbers, he is one of the great tackling linebackers in the history of the NCAA. The last two years, this Jason Henderson kid, 170 or more tackles in each of the last two seasons. I'm not talking combined. I'm I'm talking each of the last two seasons. This kid is a friggin' tackle machine, and he's one of the reasons why Old Dominion's uh, defensive metrics were so good. Their tackle rate, uh, Old Old Dominion is like top 15 in the nation in terms of securing the tackles. It's because this kid gets on the doorstep every time and doesn't miss. Now he's going to be out for this game. That is a a crazy drop-off there. Uh, For a team that had a better defense than you would think, they do have one other uh, solid linebacker, but the backups, you know, the per snap stuff, uh, you're talking this enormous loss of value there. My line when I when everything came out in the wash, I have Old Dominion minus zero point six. So it's another one of those where I think that this is a coin flip. It's tough because we're pretty close to the margins here. I would lean Western Kentucky again. I know you look at all the the opt outs on the Western Kentucky side and it sort of takes your breath away. It did for me last year too. It was the one trap that I walked into in the early slate. I, I went something like 10 of, a, uh, of 11 hitting the bowl games at the beginning. The one that I got wrong was the Western Kentucky one when they were playing uh, South Alabama because Western Kentucky had a whole bunch of opt-outs. I thought Austin Reed wasn't going to play in that game. Changed his mind a couple of days before the game. He has given no indications that he will not play in this game. 
But Western Kentucky went out in that game and slapped around South Alabama. I, I would definitely lean uh, Western Kentucky in this game. But my my real play in this one is the under. The total in this one, 55 and a half or so, depending on where you look. My system's total on this one is 51. I, I mentioned how much the offensive line Western Kentucky lost. They lost Malachi Corley. Old Dominion lost some of their receivers. Old Dominion did lose a couple good defenders that opt out at the safety and then Henderson. But there's way more defections on the offensive side of the ball. I think this game is going to be played very conservatively. These teams trying to feel each other out. I'm going to go under that 55 and a half. Mike, do you have a good feel on this game? I mean, you know, you lose Western Kentucky's a lot of rhythm and timing. And if you lose those offensive linemen and your number one wide receiver, that's a lot to lose. But like Thor mentioned, Henderson, the leading tackler for a team that tackles well, is also an enormous loss. So are you on a side? Do you like the under? What's your thoughts here? I'm going under. Um, I think it's too high. And I think it's going to be a sloppy game. Uh, you know, you lose three offensive linemen. I mean, it's just going to be problematic. They're going to have trouble running the football. They're going to have trouble protecting. Um, that doesn't mean Western Kentucky is not going to score any points, but there's going to be some, you know, ugly series. Um, you know, Henderson's a big deal. Those are like Luke Keekley type of numbers. Now, I, I, I will never put any linebacker in the history of the world in the same sentence with Luke Keekley as far as a player comparison, because Luke Keekley is a god and much better than Henderson. But those are like, Keekley was on some bad teams for BC and he just got every tackle because he was the best player by far on the field. That's Henderson. The reason he's getting these tackles is because he's by far their best defender and he just beats people for the tackles. Um, now, Nate Landman's story as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, Shout out Colorado. So he's yeah. going to be, you know, missed uh, clearly, but the, the defense is still formidable enough to, to be able to keep West Kentucky under control, especially with Corley gone and those three offensive linemen. So I'm going under. I think it's going to be a low scoring game. Sidewise, I would lean over to you, but like Thor said, it's kind of a pick them. So if you don't want to give the points, stay away from the side, go to the under. All right, let's go over to Tuesday, the 19th, the Frisco Bowl in Frisco, Texas. UTSA is a 12 and a half point favorite against Marshall. 52 and a half is a total in this one. We've got uh, tickets on UTSA and the under. Not a lot of bets coming in on this game. Thor, do you have a good lean between UTSA and Marshall? That's a lot of points for UTSA. Can they do it? Yeah, and, and that line has hopped up too. We we had it was eight and a half around the open. Then it was at ten uh, just a few days ago, and and now it's at the twelve and a half. I would have been on UTSA at the smaller numbers. Uh, now, if 12 and a half, you're getting closer to, uh, to forcing me into betting Marshall. My, my line in this game is UTSA minus 11.1. You're not, you're, you don't have a lot of value on that. Uh, my, my, my real bet though, would probably be on the under. You're pretty close to the margins there too. Uh, Bogman, what is it live right now? Uh, on the total. Yeah. The total 52 and a half. 52 and a half. Yeah. That, and that one's come down too. It was 55 and a half a couple of days ago. Th this is probably the game where in terms of like where it is in real life and then my system, th it's probably the closest. Um, so it, it, it makes it, it makes it harder. I would have leaned the under, but that, that thing coming down like that, I don't know if I could take that one as well. Um, I, I'm going to take the points with Marshall. If, if we're getting wait to 13, I <laughs> is, is what I would say on that. But Marshall has not had Rasheen Ali opt out yet. And if Rashin Ali does not opt out, they should at least be able to run the ball. Marshall had Cam Fancher opt out, the quarterback, but Cam Fancher stinks. They're going to be starting uh, Chad Pennington's son, Cole Pennington. Cole Pennington was terrible this year as well. He's even worse than Fancher was. Um, but, it, you know, at least the, the throwing, he'd be probably around there. Fancher could run the ball a little bit. Uh, Marshall also lost one of their uh, starting receivers, Caleb Coombs. But he's another one of those extension of the run game guys that doesn't go deep at all. It's just – the, the quick funnel screens on the outside. Marshall also lost his starting offensive lineman, this, this Trent Holler kid. UTSA's losses, though, are bigger. They only lost one guy that matters, but he really matters. Uh, Trey Moore, the edge, a freaking monster. The kid had 14 sacks this year, 16 and a half tackles for loss, AAC Defensive Player of the Year. His, he, so he had a 6.1% sack percentage, and he had 40 pressures. Both of those metrics doubled up, more than doubled up, the number two guy on UTSA. Um, so, I, and, and that kid's being pursued by all the blue bloods in the nation right now. He's one of the better edge def defenders in the entire nation. With with where the line movement has gone, uh, I'm going to hold my nose on this one, and I'm going to jump in with Marshall. 
Uh, Farrell, your thoughts here. Are you in on Marshall as well? I'm going under. Uh, the line's too big. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe in Marshall at all. I like Coach Hoff. I don't know what's happened there. I really don't. It's just a bad football team. They're, they're playing terrible ball. Uh, there's some internal strife going on there. Uh, there was a big issue as to who the starting quarterback should be. I mean, Hoff even came out, I think, and said the quarterback's transfer did the fans hate him. Uh, that type of they honesty, did. when you say that, that means you given up. Like, Huff's not giving up. He's not going to quit. But it's like that's a level of frustration with your players. It's like saying, and this kid's by all accounts a good kid, but it's essentially saying we aren't tough. We have have thin skin. We can't give a crap about this game. So I'm not taking them. I'm taking the under. Uh, You know, mainly for the reasons that Thor said. The quarterback played it horrible at Marshall. Um, UTSA, I don't really – trust. I don't think they're going to put up a ton of points. Um, and, and I just don't think this is going to be a high-scoring game. If it was closer to what opened at 8.5 or, or maybe 9 or something like that, I would think UTSA, but this thing keeps creeping up. I'm not not laying that many points. So it's the under. All right, let's go over to Thursday the 21st. We're skipping Wednesday, no bowl games, but we got the Boca Raton Bowl on Thursday. South Florida versus Syracuse. Syracuse is a three and a half point favorite in this game. 60 and a half is a total. Uh, tickets of cash once again split. Tickets on Syracuse, cash on USF. Also, tickets on the over, cash on the under. So this one is split on public opinion, Thor. So set it straight. Who do you like in South Florida versus Syracuse in the Boca Raton Bowl? Last one, I didn't have a great feel. This one, I feel a lot better. I'm taking South Florida. South Florida, basically your de facto home team here. I don't think any Syracuse fans are going to be traveling down for this one. You get into the better weather, but you know, you're a couple of days before uh, Christmas. And, I mean, why not be a snowbird, right? I mean, well, uh, it's got to be way better in Florida right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe if those guys live down there or whatever, but like Syracuse now in this transition, they fired Dino Babers. Fran Brown's coming in. He's not going to be coaching in this one, though. They, uh, um, who is it? Uh, Nunzio Campanile is going to be the, the interim coach for Syracuse in this game. Whereas you go against South Florida. South Florida, I mean, people may not have watched them that much outside of that Alabama game where they sort of rose up in that one in September. But South Florida in the first year under Alex Golish, they played way up this year. They ended up rallying into bowl season. They play at the crazy fast tempo and they can give some teams trouble. I think they're going to give Syracuse trouble. Dino Babers, before he got fired in October, he talked about – he threw his hands up in October. He's like, we don't have the depth, right? Like when the newest end-of-season losing streak started that, that threatened to keep Syracuse out of bowl season. And he was just telling reporters, like, straight out, like, we don't we don't have the depth. You know, you, you have any injuries, They the, the backups there, they, they just aren't playable. Syracuse, they're, they have a starting edge. Leon Lowry opted out of this game. Uh, one of their starting defensive interior guys, uh, Terry Lockett, he is also in the transfer portal, opted out. That hurts for them. Uh, they had a couple safeties that opted out as well. That's all tough. Um, of course, Aranda Gadsden, you go back to the beginning of the season, the, the very first game. I think that was when the writing was on the wall for Dino Babers when Gadsden went out. He was their one singular player. He's a matchup nightmare. They still have this solid running back. I'm not a big Garrett Schrader fan. He can scramble around a little bit, but you can't do anything through the passing, uh, through the air with him. The receiving core is not good without Gadsden. And again, South Florida is going to get on you with, with you know, with, with with a tempo, tempo, tempo. We're going to run back to the, the the line, whatever. South Florida had very little uh, losses in terms of the, the portal. Um, less than 500 snaps lost. It was a guy that Lloyd Summerall has been out for a while anyway, an edge guy. So they, they're not going to miss him because they've been playing without him. Backup safety. The only thing to watch for on the South Florida side, both of their starting guards are questionable with injuries that they had in late November. That would be the only thing that I would look into on that. But getting the three and a half points with a team, I think is going to win outright near their, you know, near where they come from. So far to going to Boca Raton here, we're, we're going to take the Bulls and we're going to take them outright. Now, uh, Farrell, you talked about before, you are less inclined to take a team that is getting the de facto home uh, field advantage here. Does that come into play here? No, I mean, I don't care about the home field advantage here. Um, I I do care about the trajectory of these programs. I think there's going to be some excitement under Fran Brown. On the recruiting trail, he's already doing an extremely good job. There's excitement within the building. There's excitement in the program itself. Uh, But this team is not excited. And, you know, they they, uh, once again started off strong and, you know, fell apart. 
Um, Alex Bullish is this team. You know, here's the story. Ready? A 1-11 and football team went and won six games and went to a bowl, and nobody's paying attention. It's the 1-11 and football team that went 4-8 and eight and finished last in the Pac-12 that everybody cares about. And, and that's Colorado. Who cares? Look at, look at what this guy's done. Um, Northwestern is also in this discussion as far as 1-11 and 11 to respectability and bowl game. Right. This team is excited. Uh, he's, he's been a, a tremendous hire, I mean, so far. Um, I, I just don't believe in Syracuse. Uh, Schrader is Schrader. He's okay. Um, they don't have, you know, as, as Thor mentioned, and, you know, they were admitted they don't have a lot of depth. Um, and I watched them down the stretch. And they didn't really seem to care. And it was one of the reasons why Babe was gone. You know, the, 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 the atmosphere um, on, on the sidelines, the excitement level on the sidelines was missing. He was missing the excitement. Uh, the team was mailing in. Uh, it was almost like, here we go again. Uh, and I think they're just going to go down there and go through the motions. And I'm going to take you a step to win this game outright. All right. Cover. Let's go to the last bowl game on the docket for this show. It is on Friday, December 22nd, the Gasparilla Bowl, Tampa, Florida. It's Georgia Tech versus UCF. UCF is a four and a half point favorite. 64 and a half is the total uh, tickets and cash, both on the UCF side, uh, All almost all the tickets on the over as well here, Thor. Do you have a good pull in the Gasparilla Bowl? I do. I'm going to go with UCF here. You know, it's another one you're, you're playing closer to home, uh, you know, in, in, in this one, Gasparilla Bowl in Tampa, UCF going to, uh, obviously they're from Florida, but they also lost a lot less, uh, UCF did, than, than Georgia Tech. UCF, they they didn't even have a starter who has opted out or is going to miss the game with an injury here. Georgia Tech, uh, multiple guys, uh, defenders, Kyle Kennard, the edge, and, and Keenan Johnson, the starting cornerback, both opt out there. And if there had been no opt-outs, these teams have full strength. My line would have been uh, UCF by almost a touchdown. Um, UCF minus 6.7 if it was during the regular at the end of the regular season in, in a neutral. But you bake in the other stuff. My line balloons to over a touchdown in terms of the modified home field, in terms of um, them having the advantage and losing less, different stuff like that. Uh, UCF, they're a team that played well at various times this season. I think this is a matchup that lines up well for them. I think they're going to be able to run on Georgia Tech. I, I think they end the season on the high note, and they win this one by double digits. Uh, Farrell, you seem to agree with that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, same thing. They're going to be able to run over them. Uh, they, they, you know, up and down in the first year of the Big 12. Uh, but, you know, they can run the football against teams that have trouble stopping the run. And that's the case here. So uh, I think UCF is the pick here. Um, I, I'm, you know, Georgia Tech, I mean, he's done a good job. Um, you know, I don't know, still don't know if he's the right guy or not. But, I mean, you know, from from interim coach to full-time to bowl. I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, but Gus has been around. He's been there, done that. Um, he knows how to game plan. He knows the physical advantage they're going to have up front and, and the ability to run the ball. So they're going to run over him. I think they're going to win this game by double digits. All right. Well, that is going to wrap it up for today. Just uh, to let you guys know the schedule, we are going to have another show next week, just like this. And on Friday the 22nd, I believe we're going to have a live show. We haven't picked a time for that. That's going to come Let's soon. Go. We will be getting an announcement for that very soon. It will be on the next show. So just pay attention for that. And that will be it for us. Remember, you can follow us all on Twitter at Bogman Sports for myself, at Thor KU for Thor, and at M Farrell Sports for Mike. We will see you guys next week. Take it easy, everybody.